Welcome to section 9.5 on the movements of synovial joints. So we have four types of motion at our synovial joints. We have a gliding movement, angular, rotational, and some special movements that we're going to talk about at the end that take place in specific joints. We'll start off with our gliding movements, and this picture should look familiar to you. It is one of our plane joints. And our gliding movement really takes place when we have two opposing surfaces that are sliding back and forth or side to side amongst one another. So you can imagine this is a limited movement that's possible in any direction, and it's going to occur in our plane joints, which would happen in our carpals and our tarsals. Now for our angular move, um, motion or movements. This is going to occur when we increase or decrease an angle between two bones. So we have all of these specific types of angular movements that I'm going to talk about in the coming slides. We'll start off with flexion. This will take place in our anterior and posterior plane, and it is going to take place when we decrease the angle between two bones. So for instance, between the humerus and our ulna and radius here, if we are pulling this forearm in, we are causing flexion of the forearm at the elbow. Another example of this would be bending a finger, curling that finger in toward you, or if you are bending your neck anteriorly, that would be flexion there as well. Now for extension, we are also going to be in that anterior posterior plane, but we are going to do the opposite of flexion. And by doing this, we are increasing that angle between articulating bones. So if we were to pull this forearm back down, that means our ulna and our radius is moving away from the humerus and we are increasing that angle in between there. Another example would be straightening your finger after you made a fist or curled those fingers in. If we look at the wrist here, when we pull that palm downward, that is flexion. We are decreasing the angle here, whereas when we move the posterior side of our hand away and um, up, that would be extension. And here's an example in the leg where we are going to move our fibula and tibia toward the femur. That would decrease this angle in here, so that would be flexion. Whereas when we put our foot back down into extension, then we have increased this angle. And what about hyperextension? So here's where it gets a little tricky because some people aren't quite as specific when they talk about extension and flexion. So here we're going to talk about this shoulder joint, okay? So we we always want to reference things when we're in anatomical position. So imagine that someone is in anatomical position, kind of like we are here in extension, and then as we move that humerus upward, this is going to be flexion of the shoulder, of the arm at the shoulder. And when we bring it back down, it is extension. But when we move even more posteriorly from our anatomical position, that is hyperextension because we're moving beyond that normal range of motion. And it's possible with extensively mobile joints that we can do hyperextension or if we do it too much and our body is not allowing this, then it can cause an injury. And regarding lateral flexion, we really only do this within the trunk and our trunk is going to move in our coronal plane. So remember that coronal plane divides our body into anterior and posterior sides. So we are just going to kind of lean over to one side for lateral flexion. This would be a lateral flexion to the left and of course, if she bent in the other direction, that would be lateral flexion to the right. And it's occurring within our vertebrae, in our cervical and our lumbar region. Now for abduction and adduction. This is when we have a lateral movement of our body part, and abduction would be moving that body part away from the midline, whereas adduction would be moving it toward the midline. So we have some examples of abduction here. For instance, our shoulder joint, 
where we are moving our arm away from the midline of our body. I always say this is like we're being abducted away from planet Earth or moving away from planet Earth. We can also have abduction take place in our wrist. So if you are standing in anatomical position, then moving your wrist in this direction would be abduction. And sometimes this is also called radial deviation because our radius is on this side of our forearm. And then if we look at the hip over here, moving your leg outward would be abduction of the hip or of the thigh at the hip. And what's interesting is when we talk about the fingers, opening those fingers up, that would be abduction and putting them back together again would be adduction. So abduction, moving away from planet Earth, adduction, we're adding those body parts back in or adding that body part back to the midline of our body. So here, moving your foot back would be adduction. And also here in the wrist, moving your wrist over towards the midline of the body, that would be adduction. And this is also called ulnar deviation. And now for circumduction. This is going to happen at the proximal ends of our appendages relative to them just being stationary. So it's when that distal end makes a circular motion. And the way that we can do this is through four movements. It's through flexion, extension, adduction, and abduction. So we always, well, not we, but <laughs> I always kind of make this little example as to when we go to a party, there's always a bunch of different types of waivers. There is your, I'm gonna use these pictures as examples. There's your flexion and extenders that wave hello. Then there is your abduction and adduction type of hello. And then there are your crazy party animals that are going to wave hello using all four of those movements, flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. And of course, we could do this with our lower limb as well. Now for rotational movement. This is when our bone is going to pivot on its own longitudinal axis. So we've got lateral rotation. And if we look at the humerus here and we pivot our uh, forearm out, that'll help shift our humerus to lateral rotation, which is also known as external rotation. And then turning your uh, arm inward would just be medial rotation or internal rotation. We can also do this within our lower limb. So if we turn our foot out, that would allow us to laterally rotate. And if we move our foot inward, that would be medial rotation. Then we have the idea of pronation and supination. So we always say that supination is kind of like you would be holding a bowl of soup within your hand, hopefully not like in this position, but if you were to flex at the elbow and have your palm facing up, that would be how you would hold your bowl of soup, right? And so this really is a lateral rotation of the form, so that palm would be facing anterior. And then if you do the opposite and turn so that your, um, it would be more of a medial rotation or an inward rotation so that the palm of your hand is facing posteriorly, then that would be pronation. And then, of course, if we're just rotating, looking from side to side, that is just called rotation itself. And now for our special movements that didn't really fit into the other categories. So these are only really taking place at specific joints. So we can have depression take place where we're going to move our scapula down or we have some type of inferior movement taking place in a body part. For example, you can also have depression of the mandible to open your mouth. And then we have elevation, which is superior movement of our body part. So you can do this by elevating your scapula and creating a shoulder shrug, or it is moving your mandible from an open mouth position to a closed mouth position. Then at the ankle joint, we have the movement of dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So dorsiflexion is when we are going to uh, have movement take place at that tallow curl joint. And before I describe this motion too much, 
Know that this top portion of your foot is known as the dorsum of your foot, whereas the bottom or the inferior uh, surface of your foot is known as your plantar surface. So I always remember this as when I was a little girl and I would help my mom plant, my foot would be, or the bottom portion of my foot would be touching the dirt where the plants would go. So now that we understand that, dorsiflexion is going to be when you move that dorsal surface of your foot up toward the leg. So you're pointing your toes up toward the sky. And then plantar flexion is when you would point your toes down so that the dorsum of your, um, of your foot is going to be angled down as well. And this would be like a ballerina tiptoeing on their, on their toes while dancing, um, or once again, reference to gardening. When I was a little girl to dig holes, I would kind of dig my foot into the ground. And um, to do that, I had to plant our flex first, right? To serve as my shovel. And now for some more movements at the foot, we have eversion and inversion. So this is really gonna only take place at the intertarsal joints of our foot. And eversion is going to be when we take the lateral side of our foot and turn it upward. Or you can talk about the sole of your foot turning laterally. So I always remember this as being an ice skater or maybe you played hockey and you would kind of, or even skiing actually, you would turn out the lateral sides of your feet in order to stop. And then we have inversion in which we're gonna take the sole of our foot and turn it out medially, or you can think of it as taking that medial side of your foot and turning it up. Now for our terms protraction and retraction, these really take place at the scapula and the mandible. So first let's talk about the movement at the scapula here. We are gonna have an anterior type of movement for protraction, and it would be really rounding out your back and causing your scapula to move um, to the periphery. So for example, when you are doing your push-up and you are extended fully, your scapula would kind of round about and protract in order to do that. Whereas retraction would be moving that scapula in toward the midline, so almost like adduction of the scapula whereas protraction would be abduction of the scapula. And that medial border of your scapula and retraction is gonna move closer to the vertebral column. So even though he is extended here too, but he kind of dropped his body in order to move that scapula toward the vertebral column here. Now, if we look at our mandible, we can see that protraction would be jutting that jaw anteriorly at our temporomandibular joint, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, as we move through this chapter. And then retraction would be moving that jaw posteriorly at that temporomandibular joint as well. And for opposition and reposition is going to be when that thumb is able to move toward the tips of our fingers at that carpo-metacarpal joint between the carpals and the metacarpal. And this allows our thumb to grasp objects. This really is helpful if you can imagine going out throughout your life not being able to have opposition of your thumb. It'd be really difficult to do those detailed movements that our hands do. And then reposition would be just the opposite. We would move that thumb back. So opposition doesn't necessarily have to be at this fifth finger. It can be at any of these other fingers too.